Welcome to the Master of French DVD series. In this part, we shall examine White's third knight c3 move. I believe this is White's most ambitious way to look for an opening advantage against the French defense. On this DVD, we shall look at it from both angles, how to play with White against the various black responses on move 3, that are knight f6, bishop to b4, or d takes e4. Also, I'll give my recommendation how to play with black according to what I think is best today. Sit back and enjoy and learn about the French. We shall start out with looking at variations arising after knight f6 and e5, which is called the Steinitz variation. After knight f6, white has two main choices, bishop g5 1 and e5 the second. So let's start with e5. The knight now moves f to d7. A less advisable option would be to move knight to e4, because after knight e4 and pawn takes back, the e4 pawn will be a target. And white's best move right now would be bishop to c4, and white has a comfortable position. After knight f to d7, white's best move is f4, which is being played in most of the games. And black plays c5, typically for such pawn structure. As I mentioned in the other parts of this DVD series when we dealt with similar pawn structures, c5 is one of the main ideas of black, undermining white's solid pawn center. Another one is trying to get rid of the light squared bishops trying to exchange these two bishops off the board, keeping only the dark squared bishops on the board, then having blocked pawn structure in the center in the color of the bishop, is to the advantage of the other side that can potentially target those pawns, while the white bishop here is being limited by his own pawns. And the third but also equally important plan from Black's perspective is to play f6 at the right moment. White, on the other hand, has space advantage in the center and on the king's side, and White is trying to take advantage of that. White now continues with knight f3, knight c6, and bishop e3. This is the first critical moment where Black has several choices that are I would say almost equally popular. Let's start first with the old main variation, queen b6. This ambitious move attacks the pawn on b2 and invites white to play knight a4 to attack the queen right away. Then black can give a check, queen a5, and white now plays c3. This has been played many, many, many times over the years, and it leads to some really exciting variations, as you'll find out in a minute. Now, if black tries to play b5, then after knight takes c5, knight takes c5, d takes c5, and b4, which looks not bad for black at first, because now the bishop is threatening to take on c5, but white actually gains a significant advantage after a tricky a3 move, followed by b takes c3 and b4, connecting now this chain of pawns, and black's c3 pawn will be lost very soon. I remember the line back in the 80s, starting with cd4, followed by b4, and now the sacrifice on b4 used to be extremely popular, but today they consider it a solid advantage for white. Let's see how. Knight b4. If instead the queen just retreats, white has a solid small advantage with knight takes d4. So knight takes on b4, pawn takes back, bishop takes with a check. Now, of course, important, when you're in check, don't automatically assume you have to move your king. And in this case, very important, because the white bishop is also under attack, but white can save both, stop the check, and save the bishop 
by bishop d2. Bishop takes d2 and knight can only take. Queen needs to hang on to the other knight on a4. And now black can play in various ways. Black has experimented with a number of moves. I'm gonna talk about only two of them. Let's start with g5 first, which is kind of typical in the French in such pawn structures, trying to eliminate the strong center e5 pawn of whites. Like for example, if pawn takes, knight takes, looks quite nice for black with having all those pawns in the center. Now Anand played in one game, for example, knight b2, g takes f4, knight d3, b6, king f2, bishop a6, knight f3, and rook c8. And black had a decent game. Well, black, first of all, has all his pawns so far on the board. So that is, they have four pawns at the moment for the knight. So even if they lose one pawn, they have still three pawns that gives them sufficient compensation for the knight. However, white can play better. After black's 13th move, g5, according to today's standing of theory, white's best move is to play rook b1. And after g takes f4, bishop b5. That's why it was important to bring the rook to b1 to prepare this bishop move. If the bishop is being attacked, then white just trades, and the knight can jump into b6, a very nice square supported by the rook. And against other moves, knight c5 is the idea to use the pin. Both the black f4 and d4 pawns are quite shaky, and white can count on a solid advantage here. Let's go back to move 13 where black played g5 in the last variation. Another option is to play b6 right away to open up the diagonal of black's light squared bishop and then after bishop d3 to play bishop a6. Then white's best move is to retreat the knight from the edge of the board to b2 protecting the bishop knight c5, bishop takes a6, queen takes a6, and queen e2 giving white a small but steady advantage. It's true that black still has three pawns for the knight, but unfortunately two of those three pawns are doubled. So it's really only like two and a half pawns, and that's about half a point is white's advantage here. Going back to the ninth move, after white just blocked the check by playing c2 to c3, we already saw two options for black, one to capture the pawn on d4, and the other, that was b5, attacking the knight. Probably the most solid and best option at this point for black is to play c4 and close the position. Now white has to be careful to make sure that knight on a4 doesn't get in serious trouble. Therefore, White's best move right now is to play b4. Make sure that knight can return to b2, or if it can, jump to c5 with sufficient support. The queen returns to c7, better than doing en passant. And white plays g3. Bishop e7. Bishop h3, preparing a potential pawn breakthrough with f4, f5. b5, knight c5, a5, 
and of course not capturing but protecting the b4 pawn again with a3 pawn takes pawn and a pawn takes back rook takes rook and queen takes back and after knight takes c5 white takes back with the d pawn and both sides castle with still a rich middle game ahead but I would prefer slightly white's chances. Let's see it from the beginning. e4, e6, d4, d5, knight c3, knight f6, e5, knight f to d7, f4, c5, knight f3, knight c6, and bishop e3. So we're back to this critical juncture where we saw what happens after queen b6 now we're about to see the variations that arise after pawn takes pawn on d4 and knight takes d4 so in this position black had two options playing queen b6 or bishop c5 let's start first looking at the interesting possibilities with queen b6 here white likes to sacrifice that pawn on b2 which is of course always somewhat risky Let's see what happens. Queen b2, rook b1, queen a3, and bishop b5, attacking the knight on c6. Now black can trade, bishop takes, and black bishop goes to b4. White castles, so does black. And white can play rook b3. Now white's idea is, after of course the queen retreats to a5, to move the queen out of this pin and then move the knight and try to get the rook and the queen over and attack the king together with trying to push the f4 pawn to f5 and f6. I think white has enough compensation for a pawn. I'm not sure if it's more, but it's certainly an interesting line to investigate further. The other more solid option for black is to play bishop c5, queen d2, and now castle. Some other options are, instead of castling, to play a6, and white typically in this variation castles to the queen side, queen c7, and now queen f2. Queen f2 has some ideas of some potential discoveries with knight e6. Of course, carefully, because knight e6 in such position would not be a good idea, because bishop could take on e3 with a check, and then white would lose the knight. So before any knight jumps, white may need to play king b1, of course. Black would take now on d4. Bishop takes back, castles, and bishop d3, b5, queen h4, threatening checkmate, h6, and knight e2, protecting the bishop. That was a very nice game between Kramnik versus Rajabov in 2003 that you may want to look at. How that game continued. White is slightly better here. Going back to the ninth move after white's queen d2 move, the other option besides castling was to start trading right away on d4. First the knights, then the bishops, and then even try to trade queens by playing queen b6. Here white's best option is to play knight b5, with of course a serious threat of trading queens and then forking with the knight on c7 as well as aiming to get to the d6 square with a check. Now black is pretty much forced to trade. Knight takes back and white has a small but solid advantage. Why? because the dark square bishops are traded off and the light square bishops are on the board. As in general, one of the difficulties playing the French defense as black is having that bishop on c8. 
that's limited with this pawn structure of all these black pawns being on light squares, the same color with the bishop. It's not pleasant having it if you can try to trade off that bishop. And in fact, that is why black so often, especially let's say in an endgame like this, would be trying to play f6 and e5, liberating that bishop from the prison of the pawns. Naturally, white would try to keep as long as possible that pawn on e5 and not help black by allowing all those traits and liberation. Black plays king e7, protecting the pawn on e6 to enable to play f6 next. Another idea black has in such positions is to play g5. With the same idea, trying to lure away this pawn from f4 from the defense of the e5 pawn. And that's one of the reasons why white plays now h4, preventing that idea, as well as perhaps trying to gain more space on the king's side with playing h5. Black played h5. And now the white rook appeared from the side, which is not uncommon in the French. Rook h3, a6, and rook c3, giving white a little advantage again. This is not something I'd like to see if I'm black. Again, we're back at this position after white's ninth move, queen d2, where now we look at the most natural move, that is to castle. White castles to the queen's side. And black plays a6, with the idea to prepare b5 and an attack against white's king on the queen's side. Now, white's most popular move is to play knight b3. As we mentioned earlier, the trade of the dark squared bishops helps white. After bishop takes, queen takes, b5, bishop d3, b4, now knight a4, queen c7, and g4. This is how white would play now. Proceed with the attack. Bishop b7, queen h3. Provoking a weakness, h6 looks pretty dangerous after g5. So g6 is pretty much forced. Now queen h6. And then the idea is get the rook out here with quite a dangerous attack. We are back at white's 11th move. by just played knight to b3. And the better option for black is to avoid the exchange of those bishops at this moment and play bishop b4, creating a pin, trying to provoke a weakening in front of white's king's position. However, white rather plays bishop d3 anyway. b5, g4, knight b6. It almost looks a little bit like a Sicilian style of position when kings are castled on opposite sides, both pawns are running against each other's king, pretty wild and interesting. Queen f2, knight c4, and now the right move for white is to play knight e4, because if pawn takes, White has a discovery, taking the knight on c4. After knight takes e3, queen takes e3, black does not win a piece either by pawn takes knight, because after queen e4 there is a double attack with a checkmate and on the knight. And after bishop e7, which stops knight g5, white would continue with bishop to c5 with a small advantage, but it's a very sharp position and I can recommend for both sides to try it out, experiment with it. Let's see it again from the beginning. e4, a6, d4, d5, knight c3, knight f6, e4, knight d7, f4, c5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop e3. 
So we saw queen b6, we saw pawn takes pawn on d4, and now let's see the today's most popular continuation, that is a6, which prepares b5, obviously. White plays queen d2, preparing the long side castle, b5, and white most often plays a3. In this position, black has tried various moves, among them even the weird-looking g5. Not with the greatest success, though, because white takes with the pawn. And after pawn takes on d4, white would take with the knight. And after knight c takes on e5, knight f3, white had some advantage in the games that were played. Black's problem is the king is stuck in the middle and has no potential castling on either side safely. White is much better developed and can develop a strong attack. Another move that has been frequently played on the highest levels is queen a5, making a pin over the a3 pawn and still having the idea to play b4 next. For example, in one of the many Anand Ivanchuk games from 2005, Anand played just a simple bishop e2 when Ivanchuk got a good game after playing b4, forcing the knight to move back, and then playing c4. And a3 followed with c3. I think a better plan for white is, after nine queen a5, to take on c5 right away. After bishop takes c5, trade bishops. Now, of course, not forking with b4, because then the knight could just capture as the rook in the corner is unprotected. But play knight d4, queen b6, trade knights on c6. And then play b4, chase the knight away. Knight e4, trade knights, and now, very quickly, play rook c1 and c4 next. With a little advantage for white, because again, black has the double pawns. And white manages to secure his king's position right on time. After bc4, it's important to first play queen e3, avoiding any possible pushes with e4 to e3. In a very famous game between Kasparov and Rajabov from the famous Linares tournament in 2003, black played queen b6. However, white got a solid advantage after knight e2, c4, g4, h5, Pawn takes, rook takes, knight g3, rook h8. And in this position, Kasparov played prematurely f5, although had a serious advantage in the game, but lost. But he had a solid advantage after just playing bishop g2 first and preparing f5 further in this position. We're back again at the position after White's ninth move, a3. Let's see how Grandmaster Morozevich deals with this position. In two of his games against Russian champion Swidler, bishop b7, let's see two of those games between those two super grandmasters. Bishop d3, queen c7, castle, 
and black castles on the opposite side. Knight d1, c takes, knight takes, and now one of my favorite moves in the French defense, g5, breaking up white solid center, and especially the e5 pawn. Now white made some mistakes and lost the game very quickly. Knight c6, queen took back on c6. Bishop d4, trying to solidify the e5 pawn as well as stopping any d4 moves of black. Pawn takes f4, queen takes. Rook g8. Knight e3. If instead of knight e3, white takes on f7, black gets a very strong position after bishop to c5. And now black played a very strong move, f6. White took ef6. And e5. Look at that beautiful breakthrough. If bishop takes, another pawn move forwards, finally opening up this diagonal to cooperate between the rook on the g file and the bishop and the queen on the long diagonal. White is in serious trouble. In the actual game, Swidler played f7, but then after rook takes g2, lost the queen and resigned. Let me come to Swidler's defense, who just lost the game we saw. He played it blindfoldly, although so did his opponent. He tried a different way against his same opponent, Morozevich, in another game in 2007 by taking the pawn on c5. Let's look at this game now. Bishop takes c5. Bishop takes c5. Knight takes c5. Bishop d3. b4. Looks quite nice for black. If white takes, knight takes back. Knight went to e2. And queen b6, not letting white castle, because then the knight would have a discovered check, for example, capturing the bishop, or even more so, jumping to e4, winning with the white queen. White played queen e3, preparing to castle. But now, black played very energetically, d4. A very strong move. Knight captured. Knight captured, and white captured with the queen. Pawn captured on a3. Rook captured back. And black played rook d8, very aggressively, not giving white the time to castle. Queen e3, and queen b2. And now white's only hope was to castle, because the rook is not really hanging, as after queen a3, bishop b5 would win the queen. And here, white black has certainly no problems. There's equal material, black is active, but white has decent chances not to lose this game. On the other hand, white went over ambitious by capturing the knight and allowing the check and the capture of the rook, which did not work out well. White lost in a few more moves. So the bottom line is, my recommendation is on the ninth move to try bishop b7 instead of the other choices. Of course, this is a very modern variation. Theory is developing still. So keep following how the top players in the world play in that position.
or just have fun and analyze it, play with your own computer, try it out in your own games. Have fun with it.